Uh, I'm Nevin Bengtsen and I'm here to talk to you about diving into low-level Apple Media Frameworks. Um, I haven't presented at Cocoa Heads in over three years, so I'm really, really excited to be here again. So thank you, Alec and Edward, for getting me here. Uh, I'm the co-founder of the UX research platform uh, Lookback. It's a set of tools that lets you record the screen, camera, and microphone from pretty much any device. Uh, so that you can talk to your users in real time, whether in, in person or remote, and do uh, like talk to them and understand their experiences of your software and thus create more empathetic software, which is uh, the reason I've been doing what I've been doing for four years. Um, so while at Lookback, I've been doing live streaming, file recording, media wrangling, code for four years. And uh, then before that at Spotify, more media. So I've been working with audio and video for uh, quite a while now. And um, therefore, I, should, I, I figured I'd share some of the hardcore details of working with audio and video with you so that it's not all in my head. So it's actually useful to some more people. So. It's going to be a lot of low-level low stuff, so strap in and let's get on with the ride. Uh, basically, the gist is Apple has some really amazing media frameworks. Um, the APIs tend to be quite verbose, um, but the fact is dealing with audio and video in all the various formats out there is just really complex, and managing to get that into a somewhat succinct framework is uh, really cool. Um, so. For most tasks that you want to accomplish on iOS with regards to audio and video, it is usually a high-level approach, something that you can do in a few lines, a mid-level approach where you can step down and take it, make it more advanced, and a low-level approach where you get access to all the goodies, uh, especially in the later iOS vari variants where they've been opening up these uh, frameworks. So I'd like to um, uh, dive right in and look at camera capture APIs in the iOS. Uh, how many of you have worked with media, like camera capture and stuff like that on iOS? So a few of you. Uh, sorry if there's uh, too much you already know here, but I figured I'd go through and uh, explain roughly how this works. And as you might have seen on the first slide, this is part one, because what I wanted to get to was like describing all the basics and then explaining all the stuff that I've built on top of that but it became quite long. So I'll split it up into parts and hopefully I can come back and do, it, do, the, uh, do this stuff on top of this uh, later. So uh, let's look at the highest level API, which where you just take a camera and you mash the video into an MPEG-4 file on your disk. It's like a dozen lines of code. Um, so your uh, big friend here is the AV capture session. It manages the, the whole like it's setting stuff up and configuring it and then running it for you. And it works with inputs and outputs. So you begin configuration, you find the device you're interested in. In this uh, case, I'm interested in the back camera. Uh, and I open it up with a try exclamation mark because this is sample code. Please don't do it. Uh, I attach it to the capture session and then I say, can you make a file out of this for me, please? And add this as, as, as the output. Uh, commit it, start running and start recording and off you go. Uh, that's basically it. Um, this uh, works great except for the, you don't have a lot of flexibility with it. For example, if you want to manage the uh, quality of the video that you get out on the file, you have a bunch of presets and that's it. So if you want really high level control of what you're writing to disk, you're going to have to dip down a level. So let's look what that would look like. Um, AV capture session exposes AV connections. It has a bunch of APIs. So without going all the way to this approach, you can still accomplish a lot. So it's a very competent API that I, I encourage you to look into if you haven't already. Uh, but what I wanted to do at Look Back a few years ago was I wanted to have really good control over the video format and quality. And I wanted to adjust the timestamps for each frame in the video so that you know I sync up my audio and my video and the touches that goes on the screen, everything should be very strictly on a very specific timeline. So to do that, 
uh, I had to dip down to another API where I don't use the normal, uh, what was it called, the um, AV Capture Movie File Output anymore. Instead, uh, I'm going to get all the data out of the pipeline. So I'm going to tell uh, AV Capture session that, hey, can you just give me the data and I'll deal with it. And you say that by creating an AV Capture Video Data Output and telling it, give me the stuff as the thing. And here I'm asking for 32-bit BGRA data. And it'll give you that in real time on a queue that you define. Uh, so why did I ask for that? Well, because if I do that, I can use an AV Asset Writer instead. And an AV Asset Writer is a generic write media to disk please class that does a lot of nice stuff for you. For example, I can configure it with exactly the, uh, the uh, resolution I want, and there's a ton of other output settings there. So you can really go wild and give it what you want here. Um, <clears throat> so how do you do this? Well, this is basically as before. Uh, and then you create the writer, you start writing, and then you get this callback very often, 60 frames per second probably, and you get these CM sample buffers. We'll go all the way into CM sample buffers in a while, but uh, for this code I'm just adjusting the timings. This is not a real function, it's pseudocode, and then I just append it to the writer input, and there we go. But you can imagine, I mean, you have the object here. This is all you really need if you want to start experimenting from some place where you want to do like compositing, overlaying some stuff. I mean, you got the stuff here. Um, right. Um, well, that worked for me for a few years. And then I wanted even more control. Uh, so I wanted a really low-level approach, uh, but to do that I'm going to have to explain quite a bit of stuff. So let's get to it. Um, before I can even explain the audio and video frameworks, we're going to have to talk about core media. Uh, core media underlays, core audio, core video, all the fun stuff with data structures that you can reuse all over the place. My biggest friend is CM Sample Buffer. I use this one every day. Um, it's used to store audio or video or MUX data, uh, compressed, uncompressed, you name it, you store it in a CM sample buffer. Um, it holds a bunch of different pieces of data. The uh, CM block buffer is the very fancy NS data. So it's like NS data except it can get its data on demand by having like a ready and a callback kind of state. And it's, it's just fancier. Um, there's a CM format description which describes the media. Um, we'll get into that one as well. And then there is the uh, timing information. So timing is usually described with a structure called CM time. We'll get into that one as well. Uh, just to give you some basics, um, a CM sample buffer for video it usually contains one frame. For audio it usually contains maybe 100 milliseconds of data. And so for, for a sample buffer, it's, it has a duration. And for audio, the duration is the duration of one sample. And we'll get into what that actually means. For video, it's the duration that, that one frame should be on screen. Um, and the, the time that a sample should be played is usually 1 divided by the sample rate, which is usually <coughs> 1 divided by 44,100. 44, um, so, Apart from the duration, there will be a presentation time, which is the time at which the video should be on screen or the audio should be played back, like on a timeline, if you imagine a timeline in a video player. Uh, for compressed video, there is also decode time, which uh, for H.264 means uh, some frames need to be decoded in advance, and the file knows about this. It's really optimized for really low power. The whole MPEG-4 st standard is defined so that really low power hardware could still decode it. So the decode timing there is there to make sure it will be able to get you video in time. Uh, when you work with video you really find a lot of legacy stuff and get a lot of appreciation for technology during the 90s actually working. It's, it's fascinating. So apart from the uh, timing information there's also some attachments and other esoteric uh, one thing you're probably going to want at some point if you're working with video 
is you want to ask a H.264 video frame whether it's a keyframe. Uh, in H.264, frames can be uh, dependent on each other, which means you can't see the video frame without having the one before, or it might have the whole frame in one sample buffer. So the constant, I don't have a slide for it, but it's called KCM sample attachment key depends on others set to no. Now you know. You're going to need it at some point in your life. OK, so that's, that's the CM sample buffer that you're going to do. Oh, I should want to mention one more thing. If you have a CM sample buffer in your debugger, you can PO it, like print object, even though it's a, a, it's a um, core foundation object. And it will give you like everything about it. So if you wonder what the hell is this sample buffer, you can actually print it. It's really, really useful. Right, okay, CM time. CM time is a opaque structure with a bunch of stuff in it. Don't try to construct these structures manually. Use the fancy macros and functions instead, like CM time add. Uh, what it is, is a vi value divided by time scale. So if you have the value 2550 divided by the dividend 1000, that means 2.5 to 55 seconds. And the reason you want this for media is because when you're working with media, you really want to describe exact times so that stuff syncs up and you're never ambiguous about which frame you mean when you, when you have a time code. Um, and CM time has cool stuff, like if you're trying to sync audio and video, which are usually, usually into different time scales, it will find the lowest common denom denominator and create a CM time for you that can accurately, exactly describe uh, that time for you. So no floats here, it's all CM time. Um, yeah, for audio, it's usually your sample rate. For the time scale, is usually your sample rate, like 44,100. And for video, uh, uses 90,000, which I found out recently is because it's, that's a number that uh, you can divide most common frame rates by. So most common video frame rates can be described with an integer in that time scale. thought that was pretty cool. MPEG uses it. So now that we know what CM time is, CM sample buffer, CM block buffer. We got the basics for being to store and transfer media. So uh, let's first tackle audio, because audio is fun, right? Uh, in theory, audio is also simple. In general, when you're dealing with low-level audio, you're only dealing with linear PCM audio. Uh, you can think of that sort of audio as an array of sample samples where each sample is basically, you know, the position of the element in your speaker. So if you have zero, that's, it hasn't moved. If it's minus one, it's like moved all the way back into your speaker or headphone. And one is it's moved all the way as far as it can out. So since audio is air that's vibrating, by making an array of these values, we can make the speaker element vibrate and therefore generate audio. So uh, the count of numbers in your array for, to describe one second, that's your sample rate. So having 44,100 numbers gives you one second of audio in that sample rate. Um, say you wanted to generate a 430 hertz uh, note, that's an A. Uh, you would generate a sequence from minus one to one to minus one again, 440 40 times, uh, like interpolated over 44,100 numbers, and there's a second of audio. Hey, presto. It's, it's very satisfying to write low-level audio code and like writing synthesizers and stuff. It's so much fun. Uh, of course, computer programmers have made this simple task difficult by having, uh, you know, sample rates all over the place. There's mono, mono and stereo and beyond, of course. Uh, of course, there are only two sane ways to represent stereo sound, and programmers chose both. So you can either have first all the left audio, then all the right, for like a hundred millisecond chunk, and then all the left and all the right. Or you can interleave it, like left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. Um, I prefer interleaved. Please never do chunked. <laughs> uh, there's, of course, you can choose floating point or integer. Floating point is great for working with audio, very high precision, easy to work with. My one and zero is just very nice range. Uh, but if you're dealing with, you're actually sending this somewhere or dealing with low level 
hardware you're going to want integers, which can of course be 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit, signed or un... <sighs> yeah. And of course, every time you work with this stuff, you get it wrong and it sounds like shit. Uh, I have a lot of broken sound files on my computer. Uh, anyways, so that's the audio. So to get core media frameworks like AV Foundation to play with the audio, you're going to want to chuck your audio into a CM sample buffer, right? That's why we went through all this stuff with CM sample buffer. So to do that, we need a CM audio format description, which uh, describes the audio for you. Um, they were lazy when they did core media and figured, you know, in this old framework we have, core audio, we already have audio stream basic description and it's shit, but it works. So audio, uh, audio format description is just an ASBD plus some extra stuff. So uh, it works, I mean, it works, but it's annoying. Um, si since that's such an annoying name, everybody just calls it an ASBD. And every time you play with ASBDs, you're reading headers for half an hour, then doing trial and errors, and then getting minus 50 error every time until like finally you find the right combination of stuff to put in there. So here's one that works. Just use it. <laughs> uh, if you have compressed audio, here's one that works. It's a lot easier. Um, yeah. That's your CM sample buffer. You could, in theory, go write your synthesizers right now. So that's fun. Um, I'm not going to go through core audio, uh, audio playback, audio effects. So much fun stuff to do with audio. But I'll, uh, I, I will say, if you want to play with that sort of pipeline, I would recommend looking into AV Audio Engine. It's an object to see, I guess, Swift nowadays, wrapper around, like a high level wrapper around core audio which is a beautiful, amazing API, like API concept executed in a way that makes you want to kill yourself. Because it's really low, C, C, it's, it's a C API with a terrible interface and, diction, you know, Apple and C interfaces, seriously. Uh, AV Audio Engine is nice, use it. Um, one thing I will mention though, because you, if you do audio, you will invariably encounter it, is to convert audio from one format to another. You usually use an audio converter for this, which is from the framework Audio Toolbox. If that sounds old, it is because it is old. Probably one of the oldest APIs still around on iOS. And it's not straightforward to use uh, because it has a like convert basic function. It doesn't work for basically anything. If you want to convert to AAC, if you want to change the same sample rate to uh, interesting stuff, you're going to have to use uh, the audio converter fill complex buffer function, which only takes the output buffer, not the input buffer. And then you have to provide the input buffer through a callback. And the whole call will be blocking. So you will need to create a thread. And then to provide that data from your original thread, you will have to use semaphores and like make it forward. <laughs> you don't want to do that. So uh, here you go. <laughs> Use that thing. Uh, sorry? It, it, it's not fun. <laughs> well, it was fun to like write it once and then never have to do it again. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I put it on GitHub like half an hour ago, so it, it, it uses internal macros and shit. Let me clean it up and it will be beautiful. It's like you put in, I went from this format to this format, Here's my delegate, go, and it does it for you, and that's it. So that's nice. It works really well. Used it for years. That's audio. Um, let's talk about video. Video is fun, right? Um, video is simple, of course. It's just a series of images played in succession. That must be easy. Uh, just as with audio, we have uncompressed uh, video and compressed video. Let's start with the uh, uncompressed stuff. You have probably encountered RGB data before, so I'm not going to go too much into detail. But uh, of course, programmers made that hard too. There's a bunch of different formats. Uh, like you can have one byte per component, or you could do like floats, which is crazy. 
uh, there is the RGB 565, so you can just stick it into a 16-bit integer. And green is bigger because these eye thingies see green really well. So you want more resolution there. And so like if you would want just a, what is this? 3 by 4 a picture of white pixels. Here you go. Uh, that's not what video usually uses. This is what you would do if you do compositing or uh, fun stuff with like drawing. But if you're going to compress or playback video, you use, um, I don't know what the real name for it. People call it planar video, U, uh, YUV, Y prime CBCR, or Y prime PBPR, or 422, or 420. They're all different, slight different variants of planar video. Where, you know, this array here is nice because you just got a pixel, then the next pixel, then the next pixel. With planar video, it's not. So, you got different planes describing uh, the image. First you got uh, the Luma plane, which is just basically a grayscale video. It says, hey. Uh, and then you got the, um, what is that? That must be the uh, CB. So that's this range. And then you got the CR, which is this range. So using two numbers, you're defining the color. And with those three numbers, you can describe a, a, an image. Um, the most common format is, I should have put it on a slide, KCV pixel format type 420 YP CBCR 8 by planar video range. That sounds simple to me because I type it every day, but I should have put it on a slide. <laughs> by planar means it has two planes, like the grayscale and then the color in a single plane. And like planar images, it's just annoying, like the, the, the sample buffer or the, the, rather the uh, byte buffer for it will have different sections and they don't even have to be next to each other in memory so you need to like manage it it's annoying but it's fast on graphics cards so you know deal with it which is what I've been doing for four years I'm gonna cry now uh, right one more thing you're gonna deal with if you're doing this sort of annoying stuff with video is stride stride is Hey, this graphics card really, really likes uh, if alignment is 12 bytes. So can you please give me 12 bytes per row, even though the image is 10 bytes per row? And you see the stuff at the end there that's not used. If you try to display that, uh, an image like that, you, this is me debugging a few months ago. Uh, and you'll see, so what basically happens if you don't take the stride into account is every row becomes skewed slightly more and because when you're using planar data the grayscale part and the color part they are different sizes because you want more color resolution than grayscale or the other way around I don't remember so even the colors are like even more misaligned so if you see this image you got a stride error and you gotta fix how many how many pixels you read per row now you know I didn't for the longest time Okay, that's fun. How do we uh, stick this stuff in a CM sample buffer? That was easy with audio. With uh, video, you could use a, a, a CM block buffer. You're not gonna, because there's a C, CV pixel buffer in the wonderful core video framework that will deal with that for you. Uh, if you see CV image buffer, that's the abstract sub subclass. So just pretend it's the exact same thing and it'll work out. Just cast it, it works. Um, CV pixel buffer is nice because it's, it's it, a lot of frameworks uses it. So it, you can even have it as the backing store for your CG bitmap context. And hooray, if you're a UI kit programmer, now you're in familiar territory. Just use your CG bitmap context functions and you can draw stuff to video. And that's fun. And once you have a CM sample buffer in just a second, you can mash your own generated video into video files in your AV Foundation pipeline. And that's fun. Um, yeah. Just one thing to be careful with about CV pixel buffer and video in general, an image is huge, like several megabytes huge. And you're probably generating 60 of them a second. So don't just create CV pixel buffers. You need a CV pixel buffer pool which works just as, uh, you know, table view cell reuse. And you use the pool to create the pixel buffers. And whenever the retain count of one of the uh, vended pixel buffers 
uh, reaches zero, it's returned to the pool so it can be reused. So that's great for memory. One more trick that I learned recently. If you're using a pixel buffer pool, you probably have a video pipeline with a few threads. Uh, and if you just dispatch async between them, you're going to end up in the situation where uh, your producing thread is creating video much faster than it's being encoded by your hardware, in which case you run out of memory like this, because it just creates the pixel buffers. So you, you need some sort of pushback so you don't like produce too much data. And uh, iOS programmers, myself included, is usually shit at this because we don't have any back pressure algorithms in dispatch queue and the frameworks that Apple provide for us. But what you can do in this particular case is you can set the limit of how many sample, uh, sorry, pixel buffers that the pool can vend for you. And that's a nice way to like make the producing side of your video pipeline just stop for a minute and, and hold, hold up. Oh boy! Uh, now, creating the sample buffer is pretty easy because you, you can just get one of these nice video formats from the pixel buffer and then you can just create your sample buffer and you're good to go. Yeah, you're good to go. I had like a bunch more things I wanted to talk about. We got muxing. I've said muxing several times. I need to explain at least what it is. It's just taking audio and video and putting them in one container in a way that the audio will be playing back w together with the video. I have so many muxing tricks I want to show you. I didn't have time to write it. AV composition is amazing. It's a really high level AV foundation class where you can basically add core animation animations to UI to CA layers in a view hierarchy that you attach to like a movie and then you can generate like composited video using only high level APIs and all the UI kit stuff you already know. It's nice. Really hard so I really gotta tell you how to use it because it took me such a long time. Video Toolkit lets you access the H.264 hardware on the device and do low-level nice stuff. This is the source code that I was going to release that I didn't get to another time. I just told you this part. And that's where all the stuff I just talked about is. And thank you. Yeah, that was some deep stuff, Nevin. <laughs> I uh, hope you enjoyed it. So, do we have any questions for Nevin? Of course. Hey, yeah. um, have you done any work? You, all right, let's start again. So, if I have a series of JPEG, essentially files, right, but in, in memory, yeah. can I ram those down a, like, via the CV pixel stuff, can I just, like, shove that down a pipeline and then get AV player to render that as a video at the other end? Thank you for the reminder. Where did I put the stuff? Um, this AV asset writer input has an AV asset writer input CV pixel buffer adapter. I'm not going to remember. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it by heart, so I've been doing this for too long. So just mash CV pixel buffers into it. And it's really easy to get AV pixel buffers out of like a UI image. And there is even some CG image provider stuff that you can look into. I'm, I'm hoping not to have to decode the JPEG before I put it into the video pipeline. So that's uh, going to be like raw Yeah, raw you're going to have to decode it. Uh, but with CV, CG image, it doesn't have as much overhead as mm. UI image. Interesting. All right. Yep. Cheers. Get a really old Mac and use motion JPEG. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that works too. Any more questions? No. Well, I'll All go right. around. So, well, you know, I'm excited for part two because I'm also dealing with pixel buffers all day, sometimes. Um, I have actually a question, but I think this is going to be part two or three. Uh, so, <laughs> you use networking as well with this stuff, right? So, this yes, data indeed. is being sent somewhere or being streamed from somewhere. Yeah. You must have. So. Yeah, I mean, we do live streaming. We use WebRTC. And uh, before we did WebRTC, we did HLS. So you got uh, transport stream files, which HLS uses. That's the style of muxing that Apple doesn't have any code for. And so whenever you look at like, OK, I want to do HLS from an iOS app. How do I do it? And Apple's like, yeah, go write your own muxer. You're like, that's not helpful. So I have maybe semi-good news for you in part two. Okay. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> OK. 
So, well, I think that's it then. So uh, please give it up for Nevin once again.